I hope to play many, many years more, but you never know. Please, Cristiano, don't retire yet. We want to keep enjoying your contribution to football. Ronaldo has warned the world about his impending retirement, even though he's still performing at an amazing level. In this video, we'll dive into the unknown details from his early days in Madeira to his current life in Saudi Arabia. The Portuguese goat story is one for the history books, and you're about to find out exactly why. Are you ready? Let's go. No one, not even Cristiano Ronaldo himself, imagined what an epic journey the Portuguese forward would have as a footballer. In fact, CR7 admitted that when he was growing up, he didn't think he'd make it as a pro. At 35, I thought I was going to be a fisherman in Madeira. And his low expectations had a simple explanation. Nothing made him believe he could become a world-class baller. Son to a cook and a municipal gardener, Cristiano was an unplanned baby and the youngest of four children living in Funchal, a small neighborhood of Madeira. Now, Madeira is a volcanic island in the North Atlantic, washed by the Gulf Stream and warmed by the African sun, the nearest landmass 400 miles away. Moreover, the family had serious financial problems, to the point that Ronaldo's mother considered terminating the pregnancy. So you see why it was hard for little Cristiano to imagine such a bright future. The kid desperately needed to find an escape from his daily problems, and football was the perfect solution. Cristiano discovered a way to enjoy life. CR7's father, José Diniz Aviero, was a kid man for the local club Adorinha. So when Ronaldo was eight and already a football fan, he joined the team's academy. And surprise, surprise, he was one of a kind. He was just like the other kids, his godfather told Goal, but he had something that was different from the others, and that was that he played a lot of football. Even from a young age, when the other kids were studying, he put his studies on the back seat in order to play football. Cristiano obsessed with improving his football skills? What? Never. <laughs> Anyways, as one of his teammates said, Ronaldo wasn't having the best time until he had the ball at his feet. Logically, he became the most important player in Adorinha, but Madeira's biggest club by far is Nacional. And the scouts started following that little boy who no one could stop. They signed Cristiano when he was 10 years old, and he had an instant impact. He could play equally well with both feet, and despite being this small, skinny kid, he had the most powerful shot in the club's academy. Ronaldo was so good that he was clearly a big fish in a small pond. And the 400 miles between Madeira and the continent didn't prevent Portuguese giants sporting Lisbon from signing him. Suddenly at 11, the boy who thought he'd become a fisherman was leaving the island to play for one of the capital's giants. As we said, Cristiano Ronaldo didn't have an easy childhood, and things weren't any better when he left Madeira for Lisbon following his biggest dream. I cried almost every day. I was still in Portugal, but it was like moving to another country. The accent made it like a completely different language. The culture was different. I didn't know anybody and it was extremely lonely. My family could only afford to come visit me every four months or so. I was missing them so much that every day was painful. Cristiano was bullied at school and had a hard time trying to make friends. He was a kid all alone and had no one by his side. So after a few months, Sporting Lisbon sent him back to Madeira. The reason was simple. They didn't want an unhappy player and Ronaldo was just having an awful time there. It took a few brutally honest talks for him to understand that a football career was not only his best option, but also his family's. This kid had to grow up and grow up fast. So CR7, who wasn't CR7 at the time, <laughs> returned to Lisbon ready to show his best repertoire. But another problem had arisen. He was too small to make a difference. I remember the first time I heard one of the kids say to another kid, did you see what he did? This guy is a beast. I started hearing it all the time, even from the coaches. But then somebody would always say, yeah, but it's a shame he's so small. So I made a decision. I was going to work harder than everybody. I was going to stop playing like a kid. I was going to stop acting like a kid. I was going to train like I could be the best in the world. And Cristiano meant every word. The Madeiran started sneaking out of his room at night to work out, gain muscle, and build the machine he would later become. That humble, shy, skinny little boy transformed himself into a competing beast who wouldn't accept anyone to be an obstacle between him and his goal. The Portuguese rising star was 15, and even though he still hadn't made it to Sporting Lisbon, he assured his teammates that one day he'd be the best player in the world. But how could he make such a U-turn? 
Football kept me going. I don't know where this feeling came from. It was just inside of me. It's like a hunger that never goes away. When you lose, it's like you're starving. When you win, it's still like you're starving, but you ate a little crumb. This is the only way I can explain it. Pretty soon, it became obvious for everyone in sporting that the kid from Madeira was ready to become a pro. Not that many people remember the 2002 Champions League third qualifying round between Sporting Lisbon and Inter, and we don't blame them. The goalless draw in Portugal left almost no reasons for us to talk about the game. But still, it's a match that will always be historical. Why? Because it was Cristiano Ronaldo's first ever game as a professional footballer. CR28. Ha! <laughs> Got <he. laughs> Got Yeah. He had a long way to go before becoming CR7, coming off the bench in the 58th minute and quickly convincing the fans that he just had to become a starter. The young star, who was just 17 back then, had a lot of participation in his first season. He scored five goals and gave six assists in 31 games among all competitions. Pretty good numbers for an underage kid that hadn't had a single minute with the first team until that season. But the fascinating thing about Cristiano wasn't his stats, but rather his unique style of play. He was a tricky winger with blistering speed and quick feet too, with the ability to beat defenders one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, I know we're not discovering anything by saying that nowadays, but in 2002, Cristiano's ability was an absolute game changer. That being said, he was ready to become Sporting Lisbon's best player in the 2003-2004 season, but a friendly game would change his career and his life. The Portuguese side faced Manchester United weeks before the new season began. By then, Cristiano was already a starter for Sporting, and Sir Alex Ferguson had been informed of his prodigious talent. But that day, he showed he was ready to play for a European giant. The electric 18-year-old drove his opponents crazy with his speed and trickery, becoming an impossible problem to solve for the Red Devils. As a left winger that night, Ronaldo was involved in sporting Lisbon's three goals, and after the game, Ferguson had seen enough. The Scotsman would later describe watching Ronaldo that evening as the biggest surge of excitement, of anticipation I experienced in football management. That excitement and anticipation may have been the reason why Fergie accelerated and beat Arsene Wenger in the race for CR7-28. <laughs> Wait, you didn't know that Cristiano was linked to Arsenal? Yes, confirmation, he was indeed on Wenger's radar. In fact, the Gunners had agreed on a $10 million fee to sign the Portuguese marvel. Do you think Cristiano would have been as great as he was in Manchester had he gone to London instead? Let us know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe to our channel. Anyways, you can imagine Wenger's fury towards Cristiano's agent, Jorge Mendes, once the agreement was announced with Manchester United instead. So a week later, the teenager arrived at Old Trafford. United were signing a hot prospect, yes, but no one, maybe not even Sir Alex or Cristiano himself, knew just how incredible his journey at Manchester would be. As if it had been scripted, Ronaldo's arrival to Manchester United matched with a legend's departure from Old Trafford. Earlier in that summer transfer window, David Beckham left United to join Real Madrid. And that's when Ferguson had the first father-son teaching moment towards the winger. You see, it was Sir Alex who convinced Cristiano to use the number that Beckham, Cantona, and George Best, among others, had made iconic for the Red Devils. Moved by the coach's confidence in him, Cristiano agreed to wear the number seven on his shirt, and that is how CR28 became CR7 forever. Well, except for a brief period at Real Madrid, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's wind it back a notch. With the number seven on his back, Ronaldo made his debut for Manchester United against Bolton. You'd think that an 18-year-old boy who'd had no experience overseas and wearing the most iconic number of a gigantic club would need time to adapt, right? Well, not him. 30 minutes and a few touches were enough to be praised by not only the fans, but also media and club legends. In fact, that same afternoon, George Best explained exactly just how surprising CR7's debut had been. There have been a few players described as the new George Best over the years, but this is the first time it's been a compliment to me. Cristiano's legendary era at Old Trafford had officially started. So yeah, CR7's debut was pretty good. So good that the fans chanted, there's only one Ronaldo at the final whistle. Fun fact, the same supporters had given the Brazilian Ronaldo a standing ovation a few months earlier after R9 had scored a stunning hat-trick against the Red Devils. But that's just how spectacular Cristiano was since day one, and the coach knew it right then. It was a marvelous debut, almost unbelievable. It looks like the United fans have a new hero. Filled with confidence and boosted by the fans' constant support, 
Cristiano made it to the starting 11 in that same season. Now back then, he wasn't the star forward that he is today. In his early days as a Red Devil, he was the dribbler instead of the finisher. Six goals and seven assists in his first year gave him an important role within the first team, and he lifted his first trophy in England, the 2003-2004 FA Cup trophy. Cristiano scored the opener and was arguably the best player on the pitch, although Ruud van Nistelrooy's brace did result in winning man of the match that day. CR7's first season had been a success in terms of adaptation and growth. He had completely reinvented himself, leaving his individual star behind to become a more team-focused player. Still, the media criticized him on occasion for not passing the ball and was often deemed an immature player. So by the time his second season with the Red Devils started, he had to prove them wrong. Again, the Portuguese forward showed that he was a world-class baller or potentially one at least. A brace against title contenders Arsenal put him as a candidate for the Premier League Player of the Year for the first time. And Man United reached the FA Cup final once again, although this time they lost the title on penalties against the Gunners. Still a skillful player more than a striker, CR7's numbers improved. Nine goals and 10 assists were a more than acceptable mark. Ferguson nonetheless was ecstatic with Ronaldo and played a huge role in Cristiano's contract extension for two more years, valid until 2010. And Sir Alex Ferguson was absolutely right to trust in Ronaldo. The Portuguese forward scored during the 2006 League Cup final, the second title in the CR7 era. But despite winning the League Cup, the 2005-06 season had some setbacks for Cristiano. Firstly, he was sanctioned by UEFA for showing his middle finger to Benfica fans in a Champions League game. What the f***? <laughs> As a former star of Benfica City rivals sporting Lisbon, CR7 received all kinds of insults, so he never really regretted his actions. I don't have to justify my gesture, he assured after the game. I felt the public treated me badly, they were unsympathetic, and so I gave them my answer. Little did the Benfica fans know that Ronaldo would become a national hero, but again, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Cristiano's second setback was during the Manchester derby, where he was sent off following a foul over Andy Cole. Moreover, he had a quarrel with United's icon Ruud van Nistelrooy in the dressing room. Rio Ferdinand revealed that the Dutchman criticized Ronaldo due to his constant and alleged exaggerated dribbling. He should be in the circus instead of the pitch screen word in front of everyone. Do me a favor, please. Get out of here. Suddenly, the relationship was broken, so Ferguson and the board had to make a tough decision. Should they let Van Nistelrooy go and trust in Ronaldo's leadership? It was a difficult choice, but Fergie always had something for Cristiano. So by the summer of 2006, Rude was gone. Get out of here, man! Sh I'm saying. The club had clearly bet on CR7, and despite the fact that no one argued about how good he was, he was yet to truly take his game to the next level in the Premier League and the Champions League. It was time for him to deliver the promise he made to his sporting Lisbon Academy teammates and become the best player in the world. Cristiano finished the 2005-2006 season playing his first World Cup. He had already been part of the Portuguese national team that lost the 2004 Euros final at home against Greece. So CR7 was a regular starter, but still down in the pecking order, behind legendary Figo, who owned the country's number seven back then. Still, Cristiano managed to make history by scoring the winning penalty that gave Portugal the ticket to the World Cup semi-finals for the first time since 1966. Portugal finished in fourth place that tournament, their second best performance ever. After the World Cup, two things were clear. Vigo's era was over and Cristiano would take over the leadership and the number seven. Back in Manchester, Ronaldo had to deliver. Ferguson had placed full trust in him and Wayne Rooney to reclaim the Premier League crown once more. Arsenal and their newly rich Chelsea dominated the past few years and the Red Devils were not going to let that London dominance last any longer. The subsequent Ronaldo-Rooney duo was incredible and they simply owned the Premier League. But Cristiano scored 17 Premier League goals, just one less than the three previous seasons put together and also provided an additional 13 league assists too. The striker's form in the Premier League was so good that he won both the Player of the Year plus the Young Player of the Year award and he finished second in the Ballon d'Or just behind Kaka. Who came in third you might ask? The shy little guy who would soon become Cristiano's footballing nemesis Lionel Messi. It took him five years but Cristiano had finally made it. He was considered by many as the best player in the world. This question is for our not so young viewers. Do you think that Cristiano was the best player in the world back in 07? Let me know your thoughts below. So then why did Kaká receive the Ballon d'Or instead of Cristiano? Easy because the Brazilian won the Champions League. It is what it is. Man United got to the semi-finals and hopes relied on the Ronaldo-Rooney duo to take them to the top of Europe. 
they faced AC Milan and won the first leg at Old Trafford 3-2. Cristiano scored the opener, but Kaká turned things around with a brace. In the second leg, the Italians got an easy 3-0 victory to secure their ticket into the final. And that night, Kaká scored the first goal. Suddenly, the Ballon d'Or decision doesn't seem so unfair, right? So Cristiano started his fifth season at Manchester United with two objectives, an individual one and a collective one winning the Champions League, and finally, being awarded as the best player in the world. But make no mistake, even though his eyes were on the biggest prize, Cristiano completed a sensational Premier League campaign. 31 goals in 34 Premier League games earned him not only the English and European Golden Boot, but also knowledge that he could become the world's best. United won an incredible title race against Chelsea to secure back-to-back -back Premier League titles and confirmed they were the best team in England. Regardless, the fans and even the squad were going to settle with domestic glory. They wanted to lift the UCL trophy. Ronaldo continued to prosper and led the Red Devils to their first UCL final since 1999. Now pay attention. He scored the winning goal against Lyon in the round of 16. He scored the opener against Roma in the quarter finals, and he also scored in the final two. Chelsea gave United a hard time that day though. After CR7's opener, Frank Lampard scored the equaliser and the title was decided by a penalty shootout. Cristiano was in charge of the second shot and he actually failed to score, but in an unusual turn of events, his teammates got the job done. The Red Devils won their third UCL trophy, the first one for Ronaldo, who was the top scorer and was also chosen as the best player of the tournament. Well, <laughs> the feeling is great. It's my first Champions League, you know, I feel uh, fantastic, it's a great moment for me, it's, uh, I look very forward to win this, uh, this trophy, you know, it's magnificent. CR7 had made it, Europe and the world were finally at his feet. However, the joy after winning the Champions League didn't last too long for Sir Alex Ferguson, because rumours of an immediate transfer surrounded Cristiano Ronaldo. The team he was being linked to, Real Madrid, and the Scotsman didn't like it at all. You think that uh, Cristiano Ronaldo rests in Manchester uh, after the game, or uh, about what do you think about the possibility we uh, will play in Madrid next year? You hear some idiots in this place, don't you? They're everywhere. I thought it was just England that I had them. Till it's cool, just cool, into the mouth. <laughs> nice. Damn, we can assume that the Spanish journalist won't forget his encounter with Sir Alex anytime soon. In any case, CR7 remained silent until he started to feel he owed an answer to the club that allowed him to win everything. Are you going to stay at Man United or are the rumours about you going true? I stay. The Portuguese forward had publicly ended the rumours and he became the club's icon. I mean, he already was considered an idol, but rejecting Real Madrid isn't something you often see. Widely considered as the best player in the world, Cristiano started his sixth season at Manchester United with the enormous challenge of maintaining, if not improving, what they did in the previous campaign. He continued to prosper the following season as United and the Premier League's most influential attacking figure. So it wasn't a surprise when in the dawn of 2009, Cristiano received his first Ballon d'Or award. By that point, there was no doubt, he was the best player in the world, over FC Barcelona's rising star as well. The historical rivalry was about to begin, but neither of them knew it just yet. Shortly after winning the Ballon d'Or though, something terrifying happened. Ronaldo had an unexpected car crash. He completely destroyed his Ferrari, but was lucky enough to escape the accident uninjured. After that, the Red Devils won their third league title in a row, plus the League Cup. The treble was closer than ever. Man United easily won their Champions League group, and Cristiano could finally get revenge against Inter, the team that defeated him in his first UCL campaign ever. Ronaldo scored in the second leg, giving the English side the ticket to the quarterfinals, where guess what? CR7 scored the clutch goal v Porto, the other big rival of his boyhood club Sporting Lisbon. A brace in the semi-finals victory over Arsenal put CR7 and the Red Devils once again among the two best teams in Europe. The two best ballers in the world would clash in the most decisive game of their lives. The final in Roma was the prequel of what would come in the following years for CR7. Barcelona were a nightmare for the United players who couldn't find a way to stop the Argentine. The Catalans took the lead in the 10th minute and in the 70th, Messi secured the victory. In the first title decided between both, the small guy had scored by using one of Ronaldo's most prolific skills, a perfectly timed header. The Portuguese forward then understood that it was time for him 
to end his journey with Manchester United and pursue a new challenge. And what challenge could be bigger than joining FC Barcelona's biggest rivals? Real Madrid never stopped trying to convince Ronaldo to join them, and he finally accepted the proposal in the European summer of 2009. He left United as a legend and also as the biggest transfer in football history back then. $96 million. I'm arriving in Manchester when I'm 18 years old and I've been there six years. And it's not easy, but you know, the life is a challenge and um, I'm a challenger man. And um, I think it's a, it's a good move. Cristiano was ready for a new chapter and this would be the best one of his life. Although things weren't ideal at first. 80,000 people gathered at the Santiago Bernabeu to greet their newest footballer. CR7 arrived in Madrid already being a superstar, but Los Blancos aren't just like any other club. There's a pecking order to follow, even for a star signing of Ronaldo's caliber. As Real Madrid legend Raul was still playing there, Cristiano couldn't get his already iconic shirt number, and CR7 temporarily became CR9. The number nine is usually booked for the striker in football, and that could sum up Cristiano's first season in Spain. He scored over 100 goals in Manchester, yes, but his goal-scoring average in Madrid was just unbelievable since day one. Keep in mind that besides Raul, the Spanish side had some big names in the attacking third, such as Karim Benzema and Gonzalo Higuain. So in order to grow his importance within the team, the former Sporting Lisbon star had to deliver from the very beginning. And he certainly did just that. Cristiano scored 33 goals in 35 games in the 2009-10 season and quickly became a Real Madrid's attacking leader on the pitch. The former Man United star scored in his first four matches with Real Madrid, becoming the first player to achieve that mark. Everything was in place until an unexpected injury sidelined him for almost two months. Upon his return, he kept scoring in almost every game. But still, the 2009-10 season was an unhappy one for Cristiano. Why? Because Barcelona, and especially Messi, overshadowed him. The Catalans won the two La Liga El Clasico fixtures, and the Argentine scored in the Santiago Bernabeu. Barcelona won La Liga, and Leo was the top scorer. On top of that, the Ballon d'Or was awarded to the Argentine, and Ronaldo came in second. Plus, Madrid got knocked out of the Champions League in the round of 16, and Cristiano didn't even play in the Copa del Rey. So by the end of the season, even though the Portuguese forward had been individually spectacular, the fans were still disappointed. As we said, the Spanish giants just aren't like any other club in the world, and Cristiano would later put it into his own words when he wrote for the Players' Tribune, at Madrid, if you don't win everything, other people consider it a failure. This is the expectation of greatness. As hard as that may sound, it was the perfect environment for Cristiano to stay hungry for glory. Boosted by his own stats, Cristiano Ronaldo arrived in South Africa to play in the 2010 World Cup, but things again wouldn't go according to plan. Portugal built a strong defense system and the proof of that is that they only conceded one goal out of their four games. The problem though is that in three of those matches they couldn't score either. After a goalless draw against Ivory Coast, Portugal smashed North Korea by seven goals to none, with CR7 scoring the last goal. Another nil-nil draw, this time against Brazil, put them into the next round. Unfortunately for them though, Spain got in their way and Portugal would receive their first and only goal, which was enough to take them out of the World Cup. Ronaldo was widely criticized for his poor input throughout the tournament. Same as Messi though, who failed to score in Argentina's five games. So the two great players started the 2011 season with the need to show that they were still the very best. Real Madrid had had enough of Barcelona's supremacy, so they went all in and hired Jose Mourinho as the new head coach. The Portuguese GOAT met with his compatriot, and the first change came with the numbers. Cristiano recovered his iconic number seven. Raul had left Spain, and no one would dare to defy Ronaldo's wish to wear the number that took him to glory in England and Europe. The thing started quite well for CR7 under Mourinho, scoring over 20 goals in his first 20 games. But FC Barcelona were just too good for them in that moment, and the Catalans humiliated Cristiano at Real Madrid with a 5-0 victory before the winter break. This defeat led to enormous criticism towards Ronaldo, who couldn't even make it to the Ballon d'Or podium, which was entirely integrated by the Blaugrana players. Messi, who'd end up winning it, Xavi and Iniesta. But why are we talking so much about Barcelona if this is a Cristiano Ronaldo video? Well, guys, in case you were too young back then to remember, that season was a constant battle between the Spanish giants. The coaches, Mourinho and Guardiola, clashed in their press conferences even more when the derby had four editions in less 
less than three weeks. In the first one, Cristiano managed to score his first goal in El Clasico, which ended in a draw. Madrid didn't win, but it was a clear improvement after losing 5-0 a few months prior. Four days later, the two teams met again, this time for the Copa del Rey final, and that night, CR7 would finally defeat his nemesis and lift his first trophy with Real Madrid. His epic header in extra time was the clutch goal that gave Madrid the title and the hopes of beating the Catalans in the Champions League semi-finals. But again, Messi had other ideas. During the first leg in the Santiago Bernabeu, the Argentines secured a brace to give Barcelona a clear lead. And if you thought that the bad result was the biggest problem Real faced that evening, you'd be mistaken, as Cristiano then publicly admitted that he didn't like how Mourinho planned the game. No, I don't like it, but I have to adapt to what is asked of me. This is the way it is. We have a strategy. The special one wouldn't stay quiet. You know him, he enjoys a controversy almost as much as he loves winning trophies. So Jose made a decision and left Cristiano out of the starting 11 in the following game. It was allegedly to preserve his physical condition for the UCL's second leg, but the rest of the starters played anyway, so it was pretty clear that CR7's word had pissed Mourinho off. Daddy, chill. Of course, the punishment ended before the second leg, and CR7 was part of the 11 when they visited the Camp Nou. But Real Madrid couldn't perform the miracle, and Barcelona won a historical tie. It was now two years since CR7 arrived to Madrid, and even though his stats were amazing, the team had disappointed the fans over and over. Cristiano kicked off his third season as a Madridster, scoring against Barcelona in the Spanish Super Cup, but the Catalans turned things around, and a last-minute clutch goal scored by Messi gave them the title. The team was criticized on all fronts, but Ronaldo kept doing his thing. He scored five hat-tricks in the first half of the season. The Portuguese forward had now found the key to perform against Barcelona, but his teammates weren't up to the task. They were knocked out of the Copa del Rey by the Catalans even after CR7 scored two goals. They would finally beat Guardiola's side at the Nou Camp in a game that almost sealed La Liga in Madrid's favor, and guess who scored the winning goal? That's right, friends, CR7 silenced the Blaugrana fans and finally won La Liga in his third attempt, putting Real Madrid over Barcelona after several years being overshadowed by their biggest rivals. That being said, the Spanish Giants failed to bring the UCL trophy back to Madrid. Despite scoring a brace in the semi-final second leg, Cristiano Ronaldo failed to score in the penalty shootout and Bayern Munich ended Madrid's dream. A record-breaker season in terms of stats, with 60 goals to his name, ended with a bittersweet feeling for CR7, who just couldn't take the Spaniards to international glory. After leading Portugal to the 2012 Euro semi-finals, where they lost in a penalty shootout against Spain, Cristiano returned to Madrid for his fourth season with Los Blancos. At the same time, Real's president Fiorentina Perez had a, um, let's just say, peculiar opinion regarding CR7. He's crazy. This guy is an idiot, a sick man. You think this guy is normal, but he's not normal. Otherwise, he wouldn't do all the things he does. It's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? To be fair, Florentino's outburst was revealed just a few months ago, so CR7 kept on doing what he does best. In a small revenge, Cristiano Ronaldo scored in both legs of the Spanish Super Cup against Barcelona and lifted his third trophy as a Madridster to kick off the season the best possible way. But soon enough, personal problems between the Portuguese star and the club would become public when Ronaldo refused to celebrate his 150th goal for the Spanish side. I'm sad. When I don't celebrate goals, it's because I'm not happy. It's a professional thing. Real Madrid knows why I'm not happy. CR7 stated, letting speculations on his future occupy the headlines. But the rumors on how the sadness could affect his performances quickly faded away after CR7 scored a brace in another El Clasico, this time in a 2 all tie at the Camp Nou. After the winter break, Cristiano wore the captain's armband for the first time in Spain, and he would maintain some scintillating goal-scoring numbers. But the season fell apart in a few weeks. Real Madrid couldn't keep up with Barcelona in La Liga. They lost the Copa del Rey final against City rivals Atletico. By the way, Ronaldo scored a goal in the final before being sent off. What? And they also got knocked out in the Champions League semi-finals for the third time in a row, this time against Borussia Dortmund. As if that wasn't enough, rumors of a fight involving Cristiano and Mourinho made the headlines, and Luka Modric would reveal details of the discussion in his autobiography. Ronaldo didn't follow his man at a throw-in, and Jose was furious with Cristiano. When we went back into the dressing room, I saw Ronaldo upset on the verge of tears. 
Mourinho came in and started to criticize the Portuguese for his responsibility during the game. It got so heated between them that only the intervention of the players prevented a proper fight between them. Mourinho would soon leave the club after three years and two domestic titles, but without the international success for which they went for him in 2010. Cristiano scored an incredible amount of 55 goals that season, but it wasn't enough. It looked like they would forever be surpassed by Barcelona, but everything was about to change. Carlo Ancelotti replaced Mourinho as Real Madrid head coach. The Italian had previously won the Champions League, which was the club's constant obsession. Yes, winning the derbies and domestic titles was always a good feeling, but everyone, and I mean everyone in Madrid, was obsessed with the UCL trophy. Of course, that was a one-year challenge, so in the meantime, Cristiano managed to score 32 goals in 22 games during the first half of the season, which earned his second Ballon d'Or, ending Messi's four-year dominance. On the pitch, you can guess how things went. Now forming the iconic BBC with Benzema and star signing Gareth Bale, CR7 was La Liga's top scorer. Although surprisingly, Atletico Madrid ended up winning the title. Los Blancos defeated Barcelona in the Copa del Rey final, but Ronaldo, who had scored a brace in the semi-finals, missed the game due to an injury. Still, he won his fourth title with the club. But as we said, fans cared very little about domestic tournaments. They wanted the Champions League trophy, and the team would finally deliver. CR7 performed exceptionally throughout the competition. After scoring nine goals in the group stage, he achieved back-to-back -back braces in the round of 16, one more goal in the quarterfinals, and a brace in the semifinals. Madrid had reached the final after 12 years, and the last obstacle in Ronaldo's ultimate goal were city rivals Atletico, who, as we stated before, had already won La Liga and wanted to complete the best season in the club's history. Real came really close to losing the match after Atletico took the lead in the first half, but in stoppage time, Sergio Ramos became the savior with an unforgettable header. In extra time, Madrid destroyed their opponents, and Cristiano, who played, ignoring the doctor's advice of not doing so, scored the last goal in the 4-1 victory. Europe was once again at his feet. With 17 goals, Ronaldo set a new record as the tournament's top scorer. Five years after his arrival, the forward was finally getting the job done. He had become a Real Madrid legend. Without that heavy burden, CR7 took part in the 2014 World Cup, the third one for the Madeiran. But as great as he was with Real Madrid, Ronaldo had arguably his most disappointing performances in Brazil. Portugal lost 4-0 against Germany in the first game, and then conceded in the last minute in a disappointing 2-1 draw with the USA. They needed a big win in the last game to get to the round of 16. Cristiano, who failed to score then, finally gave his national team the victory against Ghana, but it wasn't enough. Portugal went home after just three games, and CR7 was held responsible for the failure. Back in Madrid, the club hoped that the UCL success would be a stepping stone for a golden era, and it would but they would have to firstly overcome a very disappointing 2014-15 season. Despite winning the European Super Cup and the Club World Cup, Cristiano Ronaldo couldn't bring more silverware to the club's cabinet. The forward received his third Ballon d'Or award, but FC Barcelona quickly ruined everything for him by winning the treble. This would obviously put Messi back on top and all the pressure back on CR7's shoulders. Ancelotti's era was over, and the board entrusted the job to none other than Rafa Benitez. At the same time, Ronaldo became Real Madrid's all-time top scorer after only six years at the club. Despite that milestone, things didn't start well for Cristiano and Real Madrid, who had a terrible start in La Liga. So in the dawn of 2016, the club subsequently fired Benitez and replaced him with a club legend yet inexperienced coach Zinedine Zidane. A huge risk, but it was just about what CR7 and his teammates needed. Before the success that would soon follow, the striker was already delighted with his new coach. I think that with Zidane, we feel more valuable. We feel his affection. I'm very happy for him. I already admired him as a player and now also as a coach because of his way of being and directing the players. He is a coach that I would like to see continue at Real Madrid. And boy, was he right to wish that. Barcelona dominated the domestic competitions, yes, but Real Madrid focused on the Champions League, and Cristiano was, well, as scintillating as usual. The Portuguese GOAT was once again crucial in Madrid's journey to the final by scoring two goals in the round of 16 and a hat-trick in the quarterfinals. Granted, he didn't score in the semis or the final, but he would have his moment. You see, Real Madrid and Atletico clashed again in the last game to decide the title. As it happened in 2014, Ramos scored for 
for Los Blancos, but this time, it was their rivals who took things to extra time. The squad, led by Diego Simeone, learned from their mistakes and didn't allow a goal, so the title was decided by a penalty shootout. After Atletico missed their fourth shot, it all went down to Cristiano's penalty kick. If he scored, Real Madrid would win the UCL trophy, the third one for Ronaldo. The forward didn't hesitate and gave the Spaniards their 11th Champions League title, the second one in the last three years. CR7 had done it again. The former Manchester United star was the tournament's top scorer and once again took the lead in the race for the coveted Ballon d'Or, which of course would be awarded to him. Although in this victory, his achievements in Real Madrid weren't the only reason to explain why he'd won the award. You see, after recovering the European crown at club level, Cristiano joined his national team for the 2016 Euros. After the World Cup disappointment, expectation amongst fans were relatively low, even though Portugal had a more than respectable squad. And the pessimistic premonitions grew after Portugal failed to win throughout the group stage. They tied their three games against Iceland, Austria and Hungary, with CR7 avoiding an embarrassing exit by scoring a brace. Ronaldo and his national team advanced to the next round, but the hopes were still almost non-existent. Still, they kept going and beat Croatia in extra time to then defeat Poland by penalties in the quarterfinals. Suddenly, and without winning a single game over the course of 90 minutes, Portugal were somehow among the last four countries, and the fans started to believe that the title was achievable. But they needed Cristiano to wake up. And Ronaldo did exactly that by scoring in the opener in the semi-finals against Wales. Their last obstacle was the home team France. Portugal were clearly not the favourites, but they relied on CR7 as their deadliest weapon. Cristiano knew that this was Portugal's most important game in history, and he started the game feeling quite good about himself. But in the 25th minute, he'd suffer an injury that wouldn't allow him to continue. Ronaldo bursted out in tears, and the whole country felt like their chances had faded away with their captain off the field. Speaking to Oh My Goal, Nani revealed what Cristiano told him before being subbed. In that moment, I was trying to push, uh, 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 motivate him to continue, to see, no, it's, it's a little pain, you can do it. But as soon as he told me, crying, it's not possible, I can't do anymore. Um, I felt that, uh, that, that, that situation and I, I said the only thing I could say to him, we're going to win this for you. Um, and then I said, I promise we're going to win this for you. Used to carrying his teammates, Cristiano transitioned himself to become an improvised head coach. He constantly gave instructions to the other players on the pitch and Portugal somehow performed a miracle. Without their best player, they managed to overcome a vastly superior French side and won the final in extra time thanks to Eder's historical goal. And for those who said that Cristiano only thought about himself, let's just say that he didn't look very disappointed about not being the final's best player. Just look how happy he was. The Madeiran was now a European champion, both at a club and national team level. He was the undisputed world's best player. Most footballers would have settled with so many trophies, but CR7 isn't like many other footballers. So upon his return to Madrid, he instantly started working out to maintain Real's dominance at the top of world football. The 2016-17 season kicked off late for Ronaldo, who was still recovering from the injury when Real Madrid won the European Super Cup against Sevilla. Moreover, a few weeks after he returned to the pitch, Cristiano showed his anger towards Zidane for replacing him in a domestic game against Las Palmas. Some media reports talked about a heated discussion in the dressing room, although it was never officially confirmed. Do you think Ronaldo gives a hard time to his coaches? Let us know in the comments below. Zizou never sanctioned Cristiano, and the Frenchman was right not to do so, as Ronaldo to continue to be by far the most decisive player in the world. During that season, he scored a hat-trick against Atletico and became the Madrid derby's top scorer with 18 goals to his name. Los Blancos would win La Liga even though they failed to beat Barcelona in both domestic games. It was Cristiano's second and last league title in Spain. Wow, just two La Liga trophies in all those years. Doesn't that sound weird, right? Anyways, back then, CR7 was already Mr. Champions League and he was about to achieve something that no one in the 21st century had previously accomplished. After reaching his 500th goal as a pro, winning the Club World Cup, and receiving his fourth Ballon d'Or, some people started to wonder if CR7's best days were over, since he had just scored two goals in the UCL group stage. Oh well, you shouldn't poke the bear. Cristiano took that personally, as MJ would say, and scored five goals against FC Bayern in the quarterfinals, a hat-trick in the new edition of the Madrid derby, this time in the semi-finals, 
and a brace in the final against Juventus. With 12 goals, CR7 was once again the Champions League top scorer and won his fourth UCL trophy, the third one playing for Real Madrid. But above all, Ronaldo and his teammates had won back-to-back -back Champions League titles, a milestone which no one had achieved prior. It wasn't just that Madrid were European kings, they were suddenly as good, is not better, than the FC Barcelona that used to torment them a few years before. The best proof of that was in the 2017 Spanish Super Cup, in which Real Madrid destroyed the Catalans with a 5-1 victory. Ronaldo scored in the first leg, but missed out in the second due to a sanction. And remember what we said about the unusual criticism following CR7's alleged poor performances in the UCL group stage a year before? Well, the Portuguese forward accepted the challenge and scored in every single group stage game. A week after that milestone, he scored a free kick goal with which Real Madrid became club world champions again. Before the end of 2017, Ronaldo received his fifth Ballon d'Or, reaching the same amount of awards as Messi in that moment. In the dawn of 2018, Real Madrid had a tough challenge ahead of them. In the Champions League round of 16, they faced PSG with a new pair of superstars, Neymar and Mbappe. But Cristiano Ronaldo was still unstoppable and scored three goals to secure the ticket to the quarterfinals. Madrid next faced Juventus, their rival in the final in the previous edition, and Cristiano scored yet another brace, including a historical bicycle kick that earned him a standing ovation from the Italian fans. A taste of what would come a few months later. Cristiano failed to score in the semi-finals and the final, but Real Madrid managed to defeat FC Bayern and Liverpool to win their third Champions League title in a row, a milestone that no one had reached since the 70s. It was all about making history, but Cristiano would soon put an end to the celebrations as he suddenly announced he was leaving Real Madrid. But why? What could have possibly happened to make him want to leave the club where he was considered almost a god? The superstar was not happy with Fiorentina Perez and revealed that as the board didn't give him the importance he felt he deserved, it was time to move on and find a new club. I felt inside the club, especially from the president, that I was no longer considered as at the beginning. The truth is that the president wanted me, but at the same time he let me know that my departure would not be a problem. I think after nine years there, the time had come for me to change clubs and move. Nine years, 450 goals, and four Champions League trophies later, the legend was gone. It was the end of an era. Cristiano could have played in almost any team, but almost no team could afford his salary. So he took a chance and joined the team whose fans had praised him as rivals, Juventus. Of course, before joining the Italian side, CR7 played in his fourth World Cup, reaching the quarterfinals. A spectacular hat-trick against Spain in Portugal's first game, plus the winning goal against Morocco, made everyone think that with Cristiano still in his prime, the European champions could dream of lifting the trophy. But CR7 couldn't avoid Portugal's exit against a surprising Uruguay side and once again went home earlier than expected. Of course, home now meant Turin instead of Madrid and Cristiano knew that the Italians would expect from him the same performances that he had shown previously in Spain. Juventus had won seven consecutive league titles and would win a further two with Cristiano in the club. Moreover, Ronaldo would add an Italian cup and two domestic Super Cups to the trophy cabinet. The thing is that when your name is Cristiano Ronaldo, aka Mr. Champions League, the fans will expect, well, the fans will expect the Champions League. That's typically how the bullshit goes, you feel me? Don't get us wrong, Cristiano did have some spectacular UCL performances playing for Juventus, but his 101 goals with the Italians, as credible as they would have been for literally any other player, were not enough for him to make history over there. Cristiano conquered Italy, but couldn't maintain his dominance over Europe. So after three years, Cristiano wanted a new challenge. Well, not literally, because he'd returned to the place where he became the best in the world. So Ronaldo publicly admitted that he wanted to leave Italy and Juventus put him up for sale. His destiny wasn't a mystery. He would return to Manchester. The thing is that if it weren't for a last minute phone call from his previous coach at Man United, CR7 could have become a citizen. I wouldn't say that Manchester City wasn't close. Cristiano admitted during his incendiary interview with Piers Morgan in 2022, but I think I did a conscious decision. I don't regret it at some point. Sir Alex Ferguson was the key. I spoke with him. He said to me that it's impossible for you to come to Manchester City. And I said, okay boss. Even a decade after his retirement, Fergie still pulled some strings in United's favor. CR7 did as promised and joined the Red Devils who dreamed of ending City's Premier League dominance with the return of a legend. And he had an instant impact with an iconic brace in his second debut at Old Trafford 
plus a last-minute goal against Villarreal in the Champions League. Moreover, in the early days of 2022, Cristiano became football's all-time top scorer. The striker scored a hat-trick against Tottenham and reached 807 goals in his career, more than any other footballer. But as great as Ronaldo was on the field, his teammates failed to keep up with expectations. With early exits in the FA Cup, Carabao Cup, and most disappointingly, the Champions League, exiting in the round of 16 against Atletico. But what almost no one knew was that it would be at least until now, Cristiano's last game in the competition that made him the king of Europe. 24 goals in 38 games across all competitions proved that Ronaldo was still in great shape, but the arrival of a new coach would soon transform his dream into a nightmare. After Ralf Rangnick ended his journey as Manchester United's head coach, Eric Ten Hag replaced him with the obligation of taking the club to a higher level. The Dutchman was never impressed by Cristiano Ronaldo, who lost his place in the starting eleven very early in the 2022-2023 season. Used to being praised by his coaches, the Portuguese legend found in Ten Hag a man who not only wouldn't praise him, but would also criticize him in press conferences. So after CR7 missed a training session, the Dutchman had no mercy with him. I said the warning in the start of the season, and then uh, when the next time it has to be consequence. Uh, otherwise, um, when you are living together, uh, when you are playing together, and football is a team sport, uh, and so you have to fulfill certain standards, and I have to control it. The critics were obviously not received well by Cristiano, who often showed his anger from the bench, knowing the cameras would follow every single step he made. After some tormentous weeks, Ten Hag tried to calm things down, although his words would only add more fuel to the fire. Oh, he's not happy that he wasn't playing Sunday, don't get me wrong, but that wasn't the question. The question was how he was how he's on the training pitch and what his mood is when he is around, and then uh, he's happy. But of course he wants to play and he's pissed off when he's not playing. Yeah, clear. Huh? Cristiano couldn't take it anymore and a few days before the 2022 World Cup kicked off, he destroyed Ten Hag and the club in a public interview. The coach didn't have respect for me, so this is why the relationship it's in that way. Ronaldo explained in his dialogue with Piers Morgan, he keeps saying in the press that he comes to me, he likes me, blah blah blah, but that is only for the press, 100%. If you don't have respect for me, I'm never going to have respect for you. Oh! The striker then gave his opinion about the club's situation and assured that he didn't see any progress since Sir Alex Ferguson left Old Trafford. The interview went insanely viral, and the board took the decision of terminating Cristiano's contract. The former Real Madrid star was now a free agent, but he wouldn't worry about looking for a new club because his fifth World Cup was about to start. CR7 and his national team were certainly not the favourites, but no one would have dared to rule them out before the World Cup kicked off. Ronaldo scored via a spot kick in Portugal's opening game, which ended in a not-so-convincing 3-2 victory over Ghana. The striker couldn't get onto the score sheet in the following games in the group stage and eventually lost his place amongst the starting 11. There were rumors regarding a quarrel between Ronaldo and the coach Fernando Santos, who opted for a young Gonzalo Ramos instead of CR7. Cristiano did feature in every one of Portugal's five games in the World Cup, although he never completed the 90 minutes. And after his national team lost to the surprise nation Morocco, the veteran expressed his suffering through an Instagram post. Winning a World Cup for Portugal was the biggest and most ambitious dream of my career. Unfortunately, the dream ended. It's not worth reacting to heat. The dream was beautiful while it lasted. Now, we just have to wait for time to be a good advisor and allow everyone to make their own conclusions. After a short vacation, Ronaldo was ready for a fresh start. He had been linked with many European teams, and he would later admit that he had several offers. But the forward shocked the world by joining Al Nasser in the Saudi Pro League. Boosted by the chance of making history in another continent, and a monumental salary of course, the former Real Madrid talisman arrived in Saudi Arabia as a certified superstar. And as it happened many times throughout his career, his performances were outstanding. But his teammates couldn't keep up with his brilliance. He completed an impressive first season with his new team, scoring 14 goals in 19 outings. A titleless campaign, yes, but with stats that invited the fans to dream big for the 2023-2024 season. And the Portuguese GOAT delivered once again. Cristiano led Al Nasser and won the 2023 Arab Club Champions Cup, 
being the tournament's top scorer with six goals in seven games. It was his first international title at club level since he left Madrid. Now at 38, Cristiano Ronaldo is still one of the world's most powerful strikers. He's come a long way since he pictured himself as a fisherman in Madeira all those years ago. No one, not even he could have imagined the global superstardom that awaited him. But to this day, he remains faithful to his ultimate belief. Always work to be the best in the world. <laughs>